Hello everybody and welcome to Microchips Design Week 2021. I'll be your host today, Clifford Swartz, and I'm pretty excited because today is actually the very first day of Design Week. Design Week is a six-day virtual event, three days this week and three days next week, where you get the opportunity to watch live demos, speak to real-life microchip experts, and furthermore, actually attend classes that those said experts designed specifically for you in this event. Now, each day we take a deep dive into a different mega trend in our industry, and it's spearheaded by a live stream. So, for instance, you guys are currently watching the IoT live stream. And I promise you that we're about to get into that, but before I do, I'm going to throw it over to Wayne Freeman in the booth, and he's going to tell you how to participate in today's event. How are you doing, boss? Doing well, doing well this morning. How are you? I am excited. Awesome, awesome. So, uh, just uh, to set a few ground rules for everyone, we are broadcasting live on YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. But uh, as Clifford alluded to uh, a little earlier, this is the inaugural design week, and we have some really special stuff for you. So after our six days, or after each day of live streaming, we actually have more content for people to, uh, to interact with on our online portal. And I'll actually have Clifford go through that in a bit, but what I wanna say is while you're here with us, uh, let's have a great discussion, ask any question that you'd like of the folks on the panel. And uh, we have several moderators in the chat, and I will actually be selecting uh, questions to ask of the panel. So uh, I, I, I've, dropped a, I've, I've dropped a comment in uh, each of the chats. Uh, say hi to me. And uh, in terms of the actual design week, we have a fantastic setup here. So once we're done here, you can actually go to microchip.com slash design week <coughs> and go sign up if you haven't signed up to re and, and register but if you have you can basically just uh, log in and in there and clifford's actually showing stuff on the screen so i'm going to look over here <laughs> it's all good you can actually interact with uh w w with some of the demos that we have available for you uh for so so for example today we have so we have quite a few iot focused demos um, we have, after our live stream keynote, we have talk tracks or webinars. Uh, we have quite a few for today that it can, you can basically watch uh, at, at the times listed. By the way, um, just a reminder, if you do see a talk track and it's the time that, that it should be on, please hit refresh. If you don't see the join button, uh, it lit up in red. Now, another thing that you can do, I'm really, really happy about, is that you can actually, you can actually talk to people through our meeting function. <coughs> so you can basically just decide, hey, I have a question for an expert. Let me go and set up a discussion. You can actually do a video conference. So lots and lots of things you can do here. Um, very, very cool. Make sure you register if you haven't already. And uh, the, the, the fun there starts at 10. Yep, yep. Now, the other really cool thing that we have uh, for you is basically in a remote location, we actually have constructed a smart home. And I have the, uh, the, the best looking booth host at Microchip <laughs> standing yeah, they, by. They let me out of the booth. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they let me out of the booth, Wayne. So. Well, 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 I'm Mike Pierce, <laughs> which uh, he hasn't told that anyone yet but we're on the other side of the microchip campus we actually built this house and the golf course that goes with it um, yes. so it's going to be a lot of fun this week so um, today it's iot so we've actually got a special guest in the house ramya hi everyone hi rain hi there ramya. Um, i'm ramya and uh, i'm a product line manager with our wireless group here and i'm here to show you the smart connected and secure home very so cool. uh you know, We'll be back here after you stop talking. Uh, after well, after the panel well, discussion. The, the panel, yeah, you never stop talking. Which so I'm, after <laughs> I'm really, really excited for, by the way. So, yeah. thank you, Mike. So, thank you. Thank you very much, and we'll get back to the uh, smart home towards the end of this live stream. I think we're ready to go now. We have three special guests. Firstly, to my left, I have Sridhar. How are you doing, Sridhar? Good morning. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for attending this uh, first <coughs> session of the Design Week. Absolutely. To Sridhar's left, we have Xavier, whose name I said correctly this time. <laughs> That's right. I'm looking forward to the discussion, too. <coughs> Thanks for having me. And then virtually, through the power of the internet, we have JR. Um, how are you doing, JR? Can you hear us? 
Yeah, can hear you just fine. Thanks, Clifford. Looking forward to design week. Absolutely. So, we have our IoT experts here. Let's get straight to it without any further ado. JR, do you mind giving the people some background about why they would want to add IoT to their design or application? Yeah, thanks, Clifford. It's interesting, um, you know, the challenges and the benefits of adding IoT into your design. Most IoT products, with a very few exceptions, weren't born with IoT. They were created dozens or maybe a hundred years ago. And now, um, only now, people are adding secure connectivity to it. You know, you think of examples like, like thermostats or vacuum cleaners and all these other things that now connect to the internet. And what does that allow you to do? You know, there's additional design challenges that are, that are required with not only connectivity, but also the security uh, communication stacks and all of those things. In the past, uh, there's been some constrained decisions that would need to be made uh, when you're designing your embedded product. There's memory, there's processing horsepower, uh, there are all kinds of things that um, you'd have to optimize specifically for your design. And once that product was shipped, it would be difficult to do any kind of additional um, you know, feature creation or over-the-air updates or, or additional revenue generation for those products. Right. So by adding IoT into your design, you can now imagine what could you do with perfect and infinite memory coupled with instantaneous computing power? And how does that change your business? And how does that change your customer's business by adding these things? Now you can kind of look at when you connect a product to the cloud, the cloud is your coprocessor. You can take all kinds of data. You can have a perfect memory of all past events. Uh, look at that in hindsight, create some foresight and insight into what could happen in the future. Uh, predictive maintenance, AI, ML, all these things are at your fingertips once you connect to the cloud, which is a little different than having strictly just an embedded product unconnected out there on its own. Absolutely. And so people that are looking to add in IoT to their designs, what are some of the big uh, savings that they're going to experience when they adopt this sort of new technology? Yeah, so when you adopt it, once you are able to adopt and you have a whole um, fleet of devices, what we look at um, and what our customers and customers, customers always look at, any, any large corporation, there's three major items of concern and all the others seem to boil into one of these three. You're either looking to increase your revenue, reduce your costs, or mitigate your risks. And by virtue of the IoT, you can do these things in ways that you never have uh, in the past. I mentioned here the top of the IoT supply chain is often service sector related companies if it's retail, energy, transportation, healthcare, um, these kinds of industrial IoT applications rely upon a whole myriad of sensors. They're all connected and the data is aggregated within the cloud. And from there you can get operational efficiencies that you've never really had been able to do before. Think about automating a factory floor or a warehouse uh, to, to look for you know, different risky conditions or ways you can improve your efficiency uh, and maybe maybe uh, increase increase your efficiency to the point where your revenue can go up. Now, no one single sensor uh, really has solved all of these things. Usually, especially in the case of the industrial IoT, it takes a whole hundreds or maybe even thousands of sensors across a plant uh, to be able to really perfectly model um, what is happening in the plant. Um, you can model these things, and and people have done that, but it changes the game and reduces your error terms. Uh, if you can actually instrument rather than model to right. get this data. And so it's all about this huge system of IoT that allows instrumentation and operational efficiency. And so from my perspective, the three that you've mentioned are just kind of objective goods that anybody who is designing a, any sort of application, product, or designing anything would be interested in keeping in mind. Sridhar, do you mind talking a little bit about some of the challenges that somebody would face and why hasn't everybody just done this? Sure. Uh, I, Thanks, JR, for that uh, nice introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, we see this as a kind of a, a paradigm shift in the industry. So we call it as the journey of challenges, as the uh, slide says there. So <clears throat> there is an industry paradox, right? I mean, it is kind of not a lot of time versus skills. The systems are getting complex. I mean, whether it is the infra IT infrastructure, the associated software, or the associated firmware that goes on with your device, so things are getting complex as the system gets more secure and connected. At the same time, the, the market itself, I mean, if you look at consumer industrial medical, the market is 
very fragmented and then these fragmented markets have their own embedded needs whether it is a microcontroller, microprocessor and within the microcontrollers whether it is 8, 16, 32 and what not. So, at the same time all these uh, what do you call the embedded markets are supported by different formats and software stacks and to top it, top it off depending on when your system was designed we also have a different development environment. So, that is one challenge from an industry perspective. But as uh, was being uh, mentioned by my colleague Jair during introduction, what we also see is the, the turnkey solution needs for the customers have changed. I mean, what they used to do 10 years back has now gotten more complex. So, from uh, our customers are expecting uh, vendors like Microchip to provide them a complete basket of solution or a total system solution as we call it, which not only in, in, involves the, the smart or the computing element, but also the security, security of the environment as also how do you connect to the cloud, which is the more, uh, main focus of the day. So, when a customer designs these things, they are bidding an end-to-end -end solution to their end customer. So, the, the challenges are many and uh, the entire purpose of this design week as well as this particular session is to walk you through these uh, challenges. Absolutely. And so you set a good scene as far as all the difficulties that somebody may encounter and every single customer is going to have a different application, a different design. What sort of is common across <coughs> all IoT needs? JR, do you mind talking to that a little bit? Yeah, definitely. You know, depending on different market segments, there's all different kinds of implementations of um, of IOT devices. What we've tried to do is really kind of try to find some commonalities amongst all the different things. You've got at the bottom there in the green, you've got your physical world. And then on the top, you've got the cloud. And in the cloud, uh, it's very end market segment dependent. What the goal is typically, and especially with industrial IOT and, and other IOT, um, is to build a digital representation of this physical world within the cloud. And again, it's usually not just one single sensor, it's a, it's a combination of them all. Now, in between that sensor or actuator um, that interacts with the physical world and its digital representation in the cloud, there's some common items where microchip can definitely help. Uh, that's in sensing, including vision um, for sensing. There's, there's control uh, if it's motor or, or actuator or power, um, charging, things like that, human machine interface, in the middle, another commonality, it's, it all requires local and edge compute. Uh, there's processing, there's local decisions that can be made, there's AI, ML uh, that can be deployed at the edge there to help you make more real-time decisions. You know, it doesn't make sense to have a, have a motion sensor that has to go to the cloud to decide whether or not to turn on a light bulb if there's occupancy in the room. So some of these decisions need to happen locally. And at the top, the interface there to the cloud, it's, it's usually it's wired or wireless connectivity. Um, as well as endpoint security is very important in the IoT. Absolutely. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so one of the things that you mentioned was edge computing. Really quickly, do you mind giving a background about what is edge computing exactly? Yeah, edge computing is, uh, has more definitions than anything else in IoT, it feels like, um, because it really depends who you ask. The edge is actually in the middle of the entire system. If you talk to a cloud, operator, the edge really is just extending the radius from the data center into the actual installation point of the, um, of the embedded hardware. From the embedded hardware perspective, it's an additional node in between uh, the sensor actuator and the cloud. And from there, uh, local decisions can be made. Software that typically would run in a cloud environment is running on one of these, usually a microprocessor or FPGA. A couple examples of this would be like Amazon's Greengrass or Azure IoT Edge uh, runtime. Um, and then there's also custom implementations of logic that can be added at the edge, which is actually in the middle. Nice, thank you very much. Uh, really quick, I have three IoT experts and I'd somewhat be remiss if I didn't ask you guys where you thought the IoT market was actually heading. So Sridhar, do you mind starting us off? Oh sure, um, uh, thanks JR and Clifford. So the point is, each market's needs, as I mentioned before, are changing, but the point is that if it, let's take the industrial market where we are one of the market leaders, uh, the designs have happened over a period of time. Uh, so there is always 
an incremental shift which the customers would like to do at the same time not having to reinvent the whole wheel. So as if you look at the industrial market in particular, let's say you're taking a factory automation floor where you have what you call, let's say an ocean of uh, uh, motor, motors which are controlling the factory automation floor. So you have done your investment, you have done the design. So now what you would not like to do is to reinvent the whole wheel and start off, all, uh, start off a new design. The point being that, uh, especially in the industrial market, so to say, we always have to look at the certification and other needs which, uh, which are critical. So the customers in this market always look to keep their investment, whether it is the, uh, the, the microcontroller, what they have used, or a microprocessor in this case, right. or the sensor. So they would like to be part of this new IoT world at the same time, keeping in, uh, the point we need to keep in mind is that they would like to make it more as an add-on solution rather than going to reinvent the wheel. So that's where this market is headed and uh, uh, microchip definitely has a key role to play and we do provide a solution whereas you are, you'll still keep your investment, what you have done, but with our smart, connected, secure, a total system solution, you will be able to add on to what you already done and be part of this new uh, paradigm. Absolutely. Xavier, do you mind talking a little bit about where you see IoT? Yeah, I mean, that kind of <coughs> lines up pretty well with what Sridhar was saying, where we see kind of that paradox where you have the existing embedded market that has bought that line of microcontroller for the sake of the example for years, try to connect them. And then we see the cloud providers and semiconductor providers trying to push into the market because we see that uh, need for connectivity, those turnkey solutions where you have your connectivity, controller, security, and all the stacks that goes with it to handle the protocol and whatnot. And that is good to reduce the friction to adopt you know, connectivity in the system. It doesn't always fit. Like, like, I think we, you're going to touch on industrial in a minute. Um, an industrial design is there for decades, literally decades. It doesn't change easily. So maybe that extra module strategy brings value there because you can keep your control there and add the module on. For consumer approach, the entire design would have to rechange there. Right. So again, like Shriar is saying, we have pieces of that complex puzzle, that fragmented puzzle to fit the needs of all those uh, market segments. For sure. And so you were talking about industrial. <coughs> Xavier, do you mind talking a little bit about some of the other particular markets that we see IoT coming up in? Uh, I think um, the, uh, maybe, sure, you want to toss the word on the uh, industrial segments? I think they are. Yeah, what, one other point, uh, thanks, uh, Xavier. One other point what I would like to highlight is the AI and ML. I think that is one of the tracks uh, as part of this design week. As we go through the week, uh, the point is the machine learning is becoming an important factor in the design because uh, if you take predictive maintenance as an example in an industrial environment, what you would like to do is, uh, let's say you have 100 motors in a factory floor, so you may not want to go and monitor each one of them individually. So right. where the machine learning comes into play is that as a part of the predictive maintenance, you go learn what is happening, whether it is the temperature of the motor or the current or voltage parameters are constantly measured and some intelligent decisions are being made at the edge which is mainly the, uh, whether there is a controller or the processor which is sitting on the platform itself. So uh, the point what I would like to mention is that uh, our smart solutions are capable of doing this edge processing, whether it is processing for connectivity to the cloud or processing at the edge for the predictive maintenance kind of a solution. So uh, you get like a combination of both uh, connecting to the cloud as well as intelligent decision making at the edge itself. So that kind of ties in well into what the, I think uh, if you extend that, we can also talk about uh, some of the retail segment which uh, would like, yeah. I mean, it would go in the same direction. Yeah, I mean, there, there's retail, there's medical, there's consumer. Uh, I'll start with um, the medical market. Medical market, I'll split into uh, two land of opportunities, I'm going to call it that way. <laughs> um, the obvious one, the visible one that we have today that uh, the medical companies that have started to uh, address pretty well is the, the, the patient. We got the patient and the hospitals. So patients, it's, it's kind of the obvious there where they're following the trends in the, of the consumer market. It's that they're building that one-to-one -one relationship between the patient and the IoT device. Now you're connecting your device to a mobile app 
through the phone. You got Bluetooth everywhere. And uh, consequently, we start to see a lot as Bluetooth to um, IoT, phone to IoT device and Bluetooth to Wi-Fi to push the, to backhaul the data into the hospital network. That's one way to, uh, to, to push the data into the, uh, the hospital network. If not, we see directly through your phone and you backhaul through the phone there. So that's the obvious one in the medical market. The less obvious one is the hospital network, and there's a, a myriad of reasons for that. Um, and they're not necessarily technical. Yeah, they're more linked to how the hospital industry exists in countries, Italy. And where I'm going into is uh, legislations, right? Legislation, if you take the US, the Europeans, the Asian countries, we all have different uh, legislation with regards to hospital. Here in the US, we have the HIPAA, uh, for example. And then now imagine if patients that have those one-to-one -one relationship with those IoT devices moving from one continent to the other to flow data into hospital networks, this whole thing works. So there's a land of opportunity that's, that's not captured from a platform opportunity standpoint. From an embedded standpoint, I mean, like I said, we see that typical architecture, Bluetooth between devices and uh, Wi-Fi into um, a hospital network. But the latest activity we've seen, I think, in the, at, the, at the medical level is the usage of the, a better implementation of security um, where you want to isolate the data for patient data privacy, right? You want to uh, control and manage the credentials that give you access to the data and so forth. And for that, we have like uh, trusted execution environment type of microcontroller processors, FPGAs. I mean, we got a, a myriad of things that can help you to achieve those, uh, those type of, uh, of specification. <coughs> so that's for the medical market, patient, hospital, complexity of network, legislation, and international uh, interoperability. Those are the things you want to you look at. And they are not, um, that's not a problem that's solved today. I was actually talking to the I, one of the IEEE leader last week um, that they're discussing the subject with a lot of global experts there. I want to lead into um, the retail. So, you know, it's about talking to the person. Talk, we talk to the patient now. I want the, the IoT device to talk to the, con, the consumer that would walk through a, a retail environment. Uh, that's also an... Uh, a segment that has a lot of opportunity to grab. So it comes down to um, uh, uh, broadcasting the ad into the IoT device the person carries. Obviously, the phone is an obvious one, but what else? And it's that what else that's still uh, a land of opportunity for that market. And, you know, as, as consumer, um, uh, that leads me into the last segment, the consumer market. I'm going to toss a few questions to JR. I mean, you're you're the eyes on the on the field there for for microchip. When it comes down to connectivity, deal a lot of with uh, consumer uh, clients. Can you tell us what you're observing in the market? What your team is observing in the market in the consumer market? Yeah, there's there's all kinds of interesting things happening, Xavier. And, and when you get to the consumer side of IoT, it's it's much different than industrial IoT or some medical IoT. Some some medical IoT could be considered consumer, but would kind of characterize it as a one-to-one -one relationship with the product and an individual. And from there, um, when creating these things, there's all kinds of creative things that can be done. Um, it used to be that uh, IoT would be added just because it's cool, but that's no longer good enough. Um, IoT would get added for a nice user interface on a mobile device that we all now carry in our pocket. Or if it's if it's if you're cool like me and you think it's still the '90s, you wear it on your belt. <laughs> um, but uh, so there's all kinds of things that that need to happen um, with consumer IoT. So in in order to make revenue on that, there's a few ways to do it. You know, one obviously you charge like a recurring service fee per month or per year or something, and the consumer would need to recognize. Uh, enough value in either ease of use or feature upgrades or things like that to um, to be able to pay for that. Um, other things that can happen, and Sridhar mentioned AI and ML, um, kind of reminds me that this old book came out in 2004 called The Wisdom of Crowds by James Surowiecki. Um, and if you look at all these connected nodes, uh, Mr. Surowiecki talks about um, these five criteria uh, that it would take for a crowd to be smart. Now, I think we've um, we all know that crowds can either be smart or dumb. Um, a smart crowd has a diversity of opinion, independence from one another, decentralization, and ability to aggregate this data in a certain way, like in the cloud. 
um, and then the end decision needs to be needs to be trusted. So if you look at a um, any kind of a consumer um, connected device, if that data can be sanitized and stripped out, and all the reported data can go into a model uh, in the cloud to make decisions on the usage of that product, and maybe something needs to be adjusted in the control or something, the devices can not only learn from themselves, but they can learn from de other deployed items uh, out there once they are aggregated into the into the uh, cloud. So with consumer, it being more of a one-to-one -one, uh, thing, it, there needs to be a lot of creativity in the actual implementation and revenue realization by adding the additional complexity of, of IoT to those devices. And, and Gerard, we were just before the session, we were talking about two examples, right? The, uh, the package delivery, you're talking about the value yeah. to the user. And so literally you can almost forget the IoT device for a second, right? And what is the, the value you get? You get immediate delivery of a package, right? That's the, uh, yep. I mean, we know the companies that are, are, are excelling at that really, but what's behind that then you have a doorbell with a video that look at the package that's connected to your internet into a gateway. And out of that, you have chimes and you have uh, security systems that can detect presence. Now you have video recognition, right? Um, well, we have the, uh, the garage door. The garage door is also plugged into uh, that type of uh, package delivery system. So now you can see the value. It's not really the IoT device. It's the package delivery device that will benefit from the IoT devices right. to inform that package delivery of what's happening. And then you can probably see, um, there's a, now you can see there's, there's a lot of uh, value into the service of delivering the package. So that was one of the examples. The other example was um, the uh, short-term rental market. Short-term rental market. So going back to what Jira was saying is connecting platforms. The one of the value there is see your door lock connected to, again, gateway into a, a short-term rental platform. What are they doing? They're synchronizing their uh, booking calendars to your door lock. I mean, the door is opening instantaneously on the right client, and that has uh, consequences in our technology. One that we start to see in the world of security is identity management. You got to drop identity management all the way down to the very device there, and how do you do this? We have. Again, those are the types of, of questions that I would welcome in the, in the chat or in, uh, in private meetings. Happy to discuss that. It's a very long session, but uh, <laughs> that's what those platforms, those service to the consumers, um, that's how they've changed in the past few years. I remember talking with all of us, right? IoT was just a remote control at that point. Right. Now we get service into it by massive company that are driving the IoT devices into all those markets. And, and so I think you bring up a very good point about how it's sort of being a partnership, how there's a whole system involved with it. Sridhar, do you mind talking a little bit to the different cloud solutions that our partners are providing? Yeah, I think uh, what the point what I would like to uh, build on what JR and Xavier said was that, as we mentioned earlier on, uh, it's not just you have the silicon or the software or the security connect. It's a kind of a basket, or it, right. a customer is looking for a complete ecosystem which will help them to take it from, as, as uh, Xavier is mentioning, from a door lock all the way to the cloud and the management of the whole, what do you call, short-term rental system. So now, <clears throat> there are uh, each customer, as we mentioned, depending on their application, has uh, different challenges. I mean, uh, if you look at a simple doorbell, you may just want to need the, to detect the presence of a person, or if you're looking at a window opener, you want to see whether it is open or closed. So, uh, the solutions have to be scalable. So depending on if it's a door opener, I mean, if it is a window opener, you may just want to have a very low power microcontroller. And then as your systems get more complex, you want the systems to be scalable, whether it is memory, processing power, or whatnot. So the system needs are different for different applications. At the same time, in this connected world, there are different cloud initiatives or vendors who provide these solutions. So whether it is AWS, free or task-based solution, or Google Cloud, or Microsoft Azure, it's also uh, for our customers in Asian market, AliOS is one of the key cloud vendor providers. So our goal here as part of our TSS, or total system solution, is to engage with these cloud partners to provide the solution which the customers would need. And so I guess a big point is that microchip as a whole is cloud agnostic, Correct. right? See that, uh, yeah, uh, build, I mean, add to, add to that, I mean, as far as we are concerned, it is any cloud, anywhere, anytime. 
Okay, so, uh, whether it is Microsoft Azure, AWS, or Google Ali OS, we connect to any cloud. So, we make our solution agnostic and it is not dependent on, okay, it works with only one or other cloud. So, we can work with any cloud of your choice. As uh, we are highlighting here, we have partnered with AWS to connect our nodes. So, there is, uh, as a cloud uh, service provider, AWS provides you not only the the connectivity mechanism, but also the software or the firmware stack to go along with it. At the same time, the, uh, the most key point here is that this ecosystem of vendors provide you also the over-the-air software updates. As you know, all the systems cannot be, you put your software once and it cannot be there forever, right? right. I mean, the system requirements change, the security needs change, the vulnerabilities are detected. So you, these systems are capable of over-the-air firmware updates. And not last but not the least, these are certified by individual vendors. So uh, whether it is the AWS and uh, as we go, uh, if you only if you look at Microsoft Azure, we do have our solutions. For example, um, as the slide highlights here, depending on a customer need, whether it is a simple 8-bit solution, which is our AVR IoT to more complex microprocessor-based solution, which is on the uh, extreme right side. Mm -hmm. uh, we have provided customers with solutions. So, for example, what we show here is a, uh, a board which not only provides you the, uh, the smart element of the solution, which is the microcontroller in this case. It also talks about the connected solution, which is the Wi-Fi module, and also has a security. So, these solutions scale across from an eight simple eight-bit microcontroller all the way to the uh, uh, microprocessor. So uh, our solutions are scalable, and just, it is just not enough to have a smart solution. At the same time, these had to be secure. Whether the security comes in the form of external threats or internal th threats, we do have what you call platforms which uh, talk about or which provide you that secure mechanism. So. My colleague Xavier will highlight some of the uh, elements of the security which we have, uh, which we have built into this ecosystem. And I think we have a, a question in the chat from Santosh. So Santosh, that's the word you want. <laughs> that's what's going to uh, get you started. So his question was, what's a full flow IoT system? It's just it's an immense uh, answer to give you. The short answer: get all those boards, put your hand on the code, and you'll see what, the, what we're giving you within the code. We'll give you the code to handle the connectivity all the handshakes from security standpoint, mm -hmm. handling the peripheral for the microcontrollers, all into the Harmony ecosystem, I believe, yeah. right? Yeah. The same so routine, yeah. that's your starting point. That would be a good answer to your question. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so I think a big point is that regardless of what you're used to programming with, whether it's MPLAB X, Harmony, or Studio, or any right. of the other IDEs that we provide, we have a dev board that is ready to get you connected to the cloud. Correct. As uh, Xavier is mentioning, these boards provide these individual components, right. but at the same time, it is just not enough having this board. So you need the software or the software stacks. So the beauty of this solution, what we have developed is, it enables you as a customer to either use your own software libraries if you have developed one, or you could use the cloud service provider software, whether it is AWS or Microsoft in this case, right. or Microchip has its own stack of software. So there are multiple ways you could connect to the cloud, whether it is your own cloud service provided or uh, microchip provided. The beauty of this is all this ties in within our, what do you call the MP lab mm -hmm. development environment. So irrespective of what you use, we, uh, we do enable you to use the MP lab integrated development environment so you don't have to go and learn a new development environment depending on what software you're trying to use. So uh, Xavier highlighted a few things about security. I think I'll also like uh, my JR. colleague JR to talk something about uh, uh, a few things what we have in pipeline for connectivity. Yeah, so for connectivity, you know, I think you know there's the, the obvious popular choices out there, the ubiquity of, of smart devices as well as Wi-Fi in the home. Uh, BLE and Wi-Fi uh, are very popular choices, and I believe Ramya is going to show us some demos here afterwards. Um, there are a number of other options, right? There's 802.15.4 variants, which we have support for. Um, there are cellular standards that we don't directly support, but we do have partners that, that implement them. 
um, and we can handle a lot of the security and identity along with those. But for connectivity, um, you know, Wired is another big popular one with Industry 4.0 um, and automation for, for very low latency IEEE 1588 type networks um, for connecting there. For wireless, um, usually it's an architectural decision if, if you want uh, low power, long range, or, or uh, high bandwidth, you can usually, for the most part, only pick two of those. So if you are going with LoRa versus Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, there, all of these things we have solutions for in each individual case uh, usually has their own use case for, uh, which would determine the type of wireless connectivity. Absolutely. So I think with that, that sort of brings us to the end of the presentation section. We have a question, Wayne? Yeah, absolutely. We do have a, a couple of questions. Um, so. Our, uh, our, our uh, good friend Jorge is, uh, has, has actually asked quite a few questions in the chat here. I love um, it. And you know, if, you've, if, if you've been kind of paying attention to some of his LinkedIn posts, he is planning to IoT the moon. That's basically his, uh, what, what he's saying in the chat. So A good goal. Um, his, his material is always fun uh, for those of you who, uh, who, who have met him. Um, his question, I think Xavier is uh, probably going to be the best one to answer this question is what is the current state of the art uh, about security for those kinds of I IoT services? For okay, there are. <laughs> so it, it depends on the market. It really depends on your market. The, um, I would answer with a big paradox. Before you think about state of the art, I think about your foundation. You have an identity that you trust and protect and manage. That's your number one. Um, you're going to have to take care of your code. You, when it boots during runtime and after an update, make sure it's, it's verified and stuff like that. Um, and you want to isolate the critical code, the critical data, and the credential, I would argue, in three different uh, co um, container if you want. So that's where you have the trusted execution environment, the secure, key, the secure key storage, like the secure element that we offer. Those are two different things that are complementary to one to the other. Those are your fundamental state of the art when you had a ton of uh, it comes down to permission to access one of those containers, I'll call them. How do you access the keys? Well, you shouldn't access the keys. How do you manage them? So then you have key management services. Uh, how do you manage your uh, trusted execution environment and access them? How do you manage those permission? Those are the things you want to think about. And there is, uh, that's your, I just painted you kind of the, the security market. You're going to have companies that are going to focus on the identity management others on the um, trust execution environments. And, and that's your challenge. Now you have to have APIs that you have to patch together. I didn't even talk about the cloud yet. That's just at the embedded level. So state of the art would be really in the server and the governmental markets really there. Um, obviously can't talk about what they, they do uh, publicly, but that's where the, the state of the art would be. I just gave you the foundation. Um, the ch your challenge will be to connect all those APIs correctly that those permission and authorization are done correctly and they are maintainable across time. Good question. I, I think uh, just to add on to what Xavier is saying, I, I think following this session, uh, there are uh, multiple sessions which are kind of IoT focused, including security. I think there is a session which uh, Xavier himself is uh, going to be talking about. We are also having a session about uh, what do you call uh, I mean the security standard one, which is at 11 a.m. Pacific uh, PDT, which uh, Xavier himself is talking about. We're also having an over-the-air firmware update with security and also a, kind of a, a session about IoT uh, using the Microsoft Azure Cloud. So uh, please do stay in for those sessions. Um, in addition, we also have uh, Microchip University, which is our, uh, what do you call, free online-based uh, technical training courses. Uh, uh, JR has been instrumental in developing a, quite a few courses as part of this one, so I would like JR to kind of highlight a few elements within the Microchip University which would be beneficial, uh, including uh, IoT. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Sridhar. Yeah, the Microchip University um, is a collection of on-demand classes covering all kinds of different topics, IoT being one of them that I've been working with. Um, but across Microchip, we have uh, FPGAs, you know, fundamentals of C design, analog and sensors, connectivity, and, and all kinds of things that you can learn um, on Microchip University for free. So um, if you click, and I see we just clicked into the tile for Internet of Things, you see a handful of classes there from, um, you know, using uh, prototyping Bluetooth with MIT App Inventor. There's Bluetooth replacing a wire with BLE. 
Uh, you can see there's a tile there for Microsoft Azure with some classes, Microsoft being a platinum sponsor of Microchip University. Uh, if you click into there, you'll see three uh, classes that we did jointly with Microsoft um, and available for free uh, on demand. Um, there's also a recorded live stream that we did a couple months ago that um, that you can also replay. So there's a lot of information for further learning on, on IoT and a lot of other things on Microchip University. And that's uh, microchip.com slash MU, uh, Microchip University or uh, uh, Mike Uniform. I love it. So we have a lot of good content that's entirely free and I'd just like to hit upon a point again. We're going to have all the links to everything that we discuss or anything else that comes up in the Q&A section in the comments and we'll also try to throw it in the description for where we can. If you can't find what you're looking for, just email us at livestream at microchip.com and I will personally make sure that you guys get whatever resource you're in need of. But I think that sort of brings us to the end, unless there's a... Yeah, there is one question which uh, I think uh, there was a question about what's our plan to do at WFY32 using like a SAM IoT kind of a solution similar to this board, what we have here. Yeah, there is a plan to do a similar board using this WFY32 device um, for IoT perspective, which has... Uh, which has a secure element built onto that. I think that is uh, planned for sometime later this quarter or early so next quarter. Soon. So Nice. So we'll have a WFI 32 based IoT board to support uh, your need. Cool. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of extra time to come up with your questions. Make sure to post them in the chat. We have shown some of the boards, but we're also going to send it over to the smart home so you guys can actually see some of those actual devices being used in real life demos. I'm welcome it over back. To you. Hi, we're done talking. You're done talking. Okay, so <laughs> welcome back to the uh, the smart, connected, secure home. Um, we're going to show you just a couple of demos that we have here. Uh, we're actually going to start with the wired IoT. We're going to show you something that's on the edge, but in the middle, as uh, was mentioned earlier. And then we're going to talk about some of our wireless boards that um, you actually can purchase. So, what's up first? We are going to look at the power over Ethernet demo first. Um, and uh, so this this is a board that we built. You know, it has a gateway. Um, we also have a dry LED driver board, sensor board, and a couple of other development boards. So what we did here is that we took the gateway and the LED driver's board, and we set that up. So the one that you see here is a power over Ethernet switch. Um, that is actually running all the lights. We installed the lights here in this home. Um, we also installed some of the blinds in the home. That's also a commercial product that's available right now. Um, and um, I, I, can, I can show you the demo and the interface of how this whole thing works. Okay, let's go look at the, uh, how you run this house. So, um, Right now, you see that all the lights, um, you know, on the display, and here is the power over Ethernet switch um, interface that we are showing. Um, all the lights are on and are at their maximum setting. Um, so let me try to dim the lights um, so that you can see. So you see, see that the uh, lights are um, are at the minimal setting now, and then you see the power reduced. So the power's dropped actually all the way to 4.9 watts now. Yeah. And this actually still lights on. So it's the dim, but they're, they're drawing low power. Yeah, so, so, let, so me, let me try to get the lights back up on. And you can immediately see that the uh, power increases to 20 and then maybe some more, so 54. So we're, we're 54 watts off a single ethernet cable. And the switch there is, says it's rated at up to 90 watts per port. That's actually quite a lot of power, especially with LEDs and, and other technology we have today. Um, you mentioned something about blinds earlier. Can, can you show us some blinds yes. working? So right now all the blinds are open. So what we're going to do is close um, the blind. And we see it happening. It's pretty cool. It's alive. The house <laughs> is alive. It's a smart home. So, yep. So this is a, a very good um, introduction to power over Ethernet and how it can be used um, in a home and actually commercial. These lines, I believe, are from a commercial company that, that do commercial buildings. Um, 
the unit we have here that we were running is a good example of the middle. It actually handles a lot of processing and can be connected up to the web as well. So it does that, that, that middle section of IoT. Um, let's talk wireless, shall we? I think yeah. I see some demos over there. Yeah, we have uh, quite a few wireless. So um, the, the first one that I just want to touch upon here <clears throat> are the SAM 9, um, you know, um, thermostat. So we have a thermostat running over a SAM 9 microprocessing unit. Um, we also have a Wi-Fi module in here. So this is both wired and wireless. Um, some of our very popular boards, though, are here, the AVR and PIC IoT boards and the um, AVR BLE boards. I know that JR, um, you know, touched upon these earlier. Um, so um, these are our very popular boards that show connectivity to the cloud. Um, and uh, for the BLE board, let me just show you a demo here um, of the BLE board. We actually partnered with Punch Through for a Lightview app. Um, and uh, so let me just show an LED turn on. So you can see that the green LED just turned on um, through the app on the phone. Nice. Um, and I just turned it off. Um, we can also try to do a push button. You can see the button state updated here to push when I pushed it. And then, um, yeah. And this, this uses our um, Bluetooth module on board. Um, and then the other two boards here are the Wi-Fi boards. So on the Wi-Fi board, um, uh, we are using a Wing 1500. Um, there was a question that Sridhar earlier answered, like would we be having a WFI 32 board um, with, uh, with the, on, on this? Yeah, we do plan to have that soon, uh, later this year. Um, but for the purpose of this board here, for this demo, it's using a Wing 1500 Wi-Fi module on board. Um, we also have a temperature and humidity click board um, that's plugged onto this board. So um, we do have a small demo that kind of shows like how the data is going up to the cloud. So I'm placing my finger here on the clickboard and you can immediately see both the humidity and the temperature um, rising. And then as I remove my finger, it's falling down. So the data is sent back up to the cloud and then back into the portal for display. Okay, that's a really good demo. Um, and it shows us the, the boards up here. So we have the, I believe the AVR IoT board with the click mm -hmm. and it's actually connecting up to Amazon Web Services. And then we're looking at our browser here to see it. So this is all live. Um, so what boards can we actually, can customers actually purchase out of these three? Can they get those ones? Oh, yeah, you can purchase all these three boards. There are also development boards there that we showed um, that, that are purchasable as well. Um, but Mike, didn't you design some of these boards? Like, <laughs> yeah, the, is, is that why got he's me giving there. a shameless plug? <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm giving a shameless plug. OK, we'll go back over here. Um, I, I spent a lot of time doing POE development uh, probably about six years ago. And we actually came out with, with this kit right here. So this kit you can actually still purchase. Um, it's a, a very simple POE development kit for, with an 8-bit microcontroller. Um, and it actually comes with a click that has, I think, a light sensor, temperature sensor. Um, these ones here are not actually purchasable, but if you really, really want to find out more, um, contact us and we can get you more information. This is a microchip POE switch. You can actually purchase this switch from us. If you're looking for a 90 watt per channel, plenum rated POE switch, um, this is it. Um, and also, from our uh, POE business unit, uh, they have a lot of uh, boards available. So this one is an example of a mid-span. So this can inject 90 watts per port. Um, our Ethernet uh, business unit also has a lot of demo Ethernet boards. That, for example, they have, I think, some boards like a four-port switch, eight-port switch um, that you can use to develop your own products from. So, so a lot of this is, is readily available from Microchip. You can find it on microchip.com and microchipdirect.com. So, Mike, we have a yes. question.
quick question for you uh, from uh, I'm, I'm not go I'm going to mask this name, so I apologize. Kufire on LinkedIn. Um, how are you monitoring the power consumption? How are we monitoring it? Yeah. Uh, that is a very good question. Um, microchip actually has power mon monitoring uh, devices. So as you saw in the demo earlier, uh, this PoE switch actually monitors the power going out each port. And it's actually built into the controller itself. And um, then there's a microprocessor in, in this unit that reads that information and uh, actually responds very quickly uh, because power over ethernet there are certain requirements and if you spike over a certain current that port will be shut down that level is handled by the actual uh, PSE so the the actual controller that's inside the, the switch um, but then that passes the information on to the microcontroller so we can display it on on the web browser that we were looking at very awesome so. awesome so uh, we have a couple of other questions. People are actually asking for the part numbers for the demo boards. I'm not going to uh, have you recite those because uh, th that, that would be a little, little difficult. But what I will say is if, uh, for those of you looking for the part numbers for the demo boards, if, we don't, uh, if they're not listed, we're actually going to post them um, in the description uh, of, of this video at the end. In addition to that, you can send an email to livestream at microchip.com if, uh, if you have any specific questions. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we would definitely make sure you get the information that you need. So, so don't be afraid to email us because we love emails. So. <laughs> so should we do some questions? Let's do it, Wayne. All right. Uh, so we've got a lot of uh, really cool things being said in the chat. Um, we actually have uh, one, one, one gentleman, and I, I'm going to uh, see if I can find his name. Uh, sh shout out to, uh, to to Rodrigo. He actually shared a design with us, so um, I'll have to share that with you guys after he requested that we share this uh, share this with you. So I'll share it with you after the live. Nice. Uh, Xiang says hi, Clifford. Hello, Xiang. And uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, Jorge has a couple of questions that we didn't get to. Uh, let's see. One of which is, uh, will your solutions be able to be supported in an SDN environment? Uh, is that something that you guys can? Are you guys familiar with it? No. Okay, no, no. so uh, send an email. Right, we'll get back to you. Um, next one, uh, how could we approach data privacy for IoT devices? I'll, p I'll pick up that one, yeah. <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very loaded question. Um, I'll give you the, uh, the three-second answer, uh, define your threat model. And what that means behind that, uh, it depends on which segment you're looking at, right? I talked about the medical early on with HIPAA. Well, what is HIPAA telling you on IoT device? Probably not much today. What is the European uh, equivalence of telling you on your IoT device? Well, that takes you to legislation. You need to understand what legislations are, are doing right now before uh, you decide what to do from a data privacy standpoint. So for example, the, the UK are really, I've, I think the UK are the first country that have really kick-started IoT legislation. I think they are in place or about to be in place right now. Everything is public knowledge. So they have like 13 pillars um, and data privacy is, is one of them. But you have other ones that are going to be mandated. I think the way they handle it, they're going to push the first three pillar, which is no default password, update your software and have a, a PCR process. PCR process is a coordinated vulnerability disclosure process that you're in place, and then they'll push the rest of it. The rest of the EU is looking into, uh, it's just following the train. Uh, you look at the White House um, Cybersecurity Act, they are kind of assigning the NIST organization to, to the same, so it's just practices really, right? And how is that going to impact uh, data privacy per market is what you want to look at. You can look at it by identifying a threat model. I'm going to take you into the embedded space. Uh, I talked about, you know, secure containers, basically isolations. Uh, of your code, of where the data are going to be, and where the credentials are, are, are. To me, those are three different things. And across them, if you remember I was talking about permission on um, the data is going to be able to be written or read and so forth by the code. The code is protected in specific space. You have the public application nope. space. So it's a whole chain of permission behind that. So how, do you, how you define your code is going to be 
adapt it to your threat model. And then at the hardware level, now you talk about secure memory, secure key storage, trust execution environment, depending on the cores. So you have to put all this big puzzle together and how long those are confidential or staying on the system. Should they stay in the system? Can you just capture them, push them to the cloud and take care of them there? So your and is your threat model and the legislation are okay with that? So there's no legislation yet for that. So that's kind of an open source. You, have, you still have quite a lot of flexibility. So it's not a, a straight answer, but again, think about your secure containers. I'm struggling with the term, but a secure container with for the code, data, and your uh, credentials. Those are your uh, keys and so forth. Start with that, handle your permissions, and that'll give you an idea on you, which hardware you should choose to, uh, to architect that. Yeah, well, one other point I would also like to highlight is uh, for all of our IoT solutions, microchip.com slash IoT is kind of mm -hmm. our landing page, which kind of gives you the lay of the land, irrespective of the, what do you call, the bit of the microcontroller, whether it's 8, 16, 32, or microprocessor, including the secure element. That kind of captures all our offerings, including the boards, the part numbers, what you can buy, where you can go and get access to the software and other things. So that will be a good starting point. And as you mentioned multiple times, if you're not seeing what you want there, you're always free to send us emails. Uh, we'll be more than happy to answer them. And please do stay on for the further sessions, which talk a little more in depth about IoT security and others right after this session. Absolutely. Wayne, do we have other questions? Um, actually, we have uh, we, we, we have a couple, but we're, they're uh, fairly detailed, so we're redirecting them to live stream at microchip.com. Makes sense. Um, but one thing I do want to mention, just to uh, dovetail with uh, what Shreed are saying, uh, make sure you go to microchip.com slash design week, because not only will you be able to see the sessions that uh, these gentlemen have discussed a little earlier, you'll also be able to request a meeting. So if you want to actually chat with an IoT expert and ask these questions, um, you have an option to basically request a meeting through that platform. So it's pretty powerful. I, I would hope that uh, all of you take advantage of that. Absolutely. And so we're going to have links. And, uh, sorry. You're uh, good. One, one last thing. Uh, there were some questions I saw coming about Python development environment. I think we do have some of our third party vendors who do provide solutions based off of the SAM, uh, uh, what do you call Cortex M4 class device based solution, which are uh, what do you call grounds up Python. So that is one option to look for when you are developing your uh, what do you call IoT solution right. based off of Python. For sure. Yep. So you guys have about two minutes to get over to Design Week, um, the actual landing page, and sign up for the next session. So we're gonna get off the air fairly quickly. Really quick though, I'd like to give a huge thank you to everybody in front of the camera, behind the camera, and uh, the viewers at home, because without you, this would not be happening. Sure. Hope you enjoy Design Week. Uh, we enjoyed putting it on, and uh, stay happy, stay healthy. Tomorrow we'll be talking about medical, so make sure to tune in for that. Great day. Great day. Uh, thank you. Adios. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Everyone.